Remember who you are. Don't ever forget who you are. And drugs will do that to you. They'll make you forget who you are. They'll start making you believe that you're someone else. You'll just get to a point where you just feel sort of like you've wasted your life. Paranoia you got me anxious when I think it's a Tiva. Confused visions of me bleeding out the reef. The insecurity of when you're around people, like what they think of you. So like they might think you're a big drug addict, so I'll go smoke some more. Just stay and maybe we can just suss something. Don't leave, you know we can have a blaze. Yeah, I cover up my problems with alcohol and drugs and that only works for maybe that night. In my life, yeah, living with the pain and strife, pulling out the knives, now the evil has arrived. I felt a bit hazy, like, imagine yourself stoned, like, not sure where I'm gonna go in life sort of thing. Sweet honey Gotta find the right check Never forget who you are Never forget who you are. First 
Fano? Yeah, yeah. Let's get comfortable. Just getting comfortable here. It was going to be Paura, but you know, once Māori boys get together and they have a jam on the guitar, mm -hmm. <laughs> then it turns into more. So this is uh, Rio Hemiopo over here on my left and probably needs no introduction um, at all, but um, I think we're very fortunate to have him as a, one of our leading musicians here in Aotearoa. And on my left over here is Lani Hunt, who's also a very inspirational role model from, who lives in Taranaki and, um, and who's also from the Hokianga. Myself, uh, Paula, from, um, from Taranaki and, and from Whanganui, but I, I live on Waiheke Island now, so um, it was very easy for me to come overseas today to be with you all. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. So we, we've, got, um, we've got an hour and a half together, and um, I did have a, I did have a um, presentation for you today, a PowerPoint, PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation, and um, hopefully we can cover some, some of those issues on the presentation, but if not, mm -hmm. you have to forgive me because we're freestyling it here, <laughs> and we, you know, it's fortunate that we have Rio here as well, um, and Lani, who were uh, a great um, contributors in terms of the documentary which you have in your, your um, bags mm. today. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit, first and foremost, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, the, about that process. I think my scarf's getting in the way. I came back from France recently with another film project called Tatara Kihi, The Children of Parihaka. And then, you know, the French, they always wear scarves. And it's like, I thought that was really great. I thought, so I've, sort of, I've taken it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might just, um, so I'm just going to grab that, uh, little, what do you call it, over here. And, uh, so this is where we'll start. I used to work at, uh, at a youth centre in, in New Plymouth in Taranaki. It was called Waves Youth Health and Development. And um, I was working there as a, as a youth worker and as a psychologist. And I guess my personal journey has been quite interesting because I didn't really come into this line of work, so to speak, um, uh, in terms of a, 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 a heavy background of um, alcohol and drugs, not that I hadn't tried it, but um, I didn't come from that perspective. I, as a young person, I, I travelled overseas to, um, and spent a lot of time in India and in Nepal, but I, I always had that inquiry, I guess, about you know, our human condition and what, what makes us be real as human beings and, and what makes us suffer. So I sort of came into the youth work working in the streets of South Auckland and the psychology field later on in terms of that particular doorway, you know. And later on when I went to Taranaki and I spent seven years ago, uh, seven years there and that's where I met Lani at working at the youth centre in Taranaki and, uh, you know, Lani, he, he'll share his story as a part of our conversation, I'm sure. But um, one day Judge, Judge Murphy Judge Rob Murphy, who's a great guy, and it's a pity he couldn't be a part of our conversation today. Mm. Yeah, I think he's, um, he'll probably be in court somewhere, no doubt in Christchurch or Wellington perhaps. But he, he walked into Waves off the street, hadn't been there before, and um, just wanted to have a cup of tea you know, and sit down. So he did that. We sat down together and, um, and Lou Roebuck was there at the time. She was a nurse practitioner working at Waves. Actually, it was her vision which established waves. And um, he said to me, uh, look, do you have the capacity here at Waves to do a, a film? Um, something around cannabis, because the reason being is because his experience working in the courts is that he'd seen generations of youth go through the courts who had an addiction with cannabis, but not only addiction, but 
also were being sentenced through the courts for either cultivating cannabis or possession of, possession of cannabis alongside other convictions as well. And, um, you know, my response to it was, yeah, sure, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. And we had some cameras at the time there from Waves. Vodafone had sponsored us a couple of cameras, which was great. And we said, yeah, we can do that. So we got a team of creative people together from the community in, in Taranaki. So there's, there's quite a lot of other people who were involved in this, so just to acknowledge them as well. And um, my friend Anan Rose said, hey, I've got this idea, let's, let's get hold of Rio and um, let's get hold of Fran. And because we had a lot of young people like Lani who were in the center at the time, who they were very musically inclined. So we, let's, let's get in these two guys and, and we can look at some mentoring around music. It was more about, it was more a, a journey of these young people and it ended up being four young men in the end, plus their partners. It was about their journey and discovering their passion and what they had to contribute in terms of their humanity in the world. So that was, that's where we started. This picture here, which we may go into a little bit later as well, it's quite significant in Taranaki and it's called, there's a place up on the mountain and it's called Te Reri o Kāpuni. Te Reri o Kāpuni is a, I guess it's a wahi tapu place in, in Māori and as we know has quite some historical significance in relation to Wudumu Ratana and also um, an old man by the name of Raumati who used to go and heal together and they used to go up to this place and they used to have healing, healings for people in the old days. So this became part of our film as well. Well, this was one part where we took the young people up to the mountain. But, um, but I thought to start with, we can talk a little bit about that journey and, and sort of um, how it came together. You know, so before I kind of hog the floor, <laughs> I'd just like to introduce you to, to Lani and uh, once again and, and Rio to kind of chip in at, at any stage. Um, they both have their own journey and that's why I thought it was really great that they could be here and, and perhaps share this, share this time. As you know, you know, there's nothing like when you're confronted with people and they start to share their own humanity and their personal journey because it really makes a, a connection with you, you know, and um, there's nothing like your own experience when it comes to these issues. Um, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello, well. um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm Lani Hunt, I'm 31 years old. Um, I've been a street kid since I was 13 um, till I was 23 or 24. So I've lived in Whangarei for 20 years and just stayed on the street there um, through to Kaitaia, New um, Auckland and then into New Puna. Um, and I was stuck on drugs all my life, thought it was the norm. Kia ora. Yeah, 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 there we are. Um, yeah, so I just thought it was the norm, you know. So. Um, for those whole, I, I had a um, role model as a 13 year old, from age of three I was a whang out in my family. So I didn't know my mum or my dad, so I was gifted away to a grand auntie who was a kui on a marae in a little place called Whananaki. And she was a justice of the peace, um, she was everything good. So basically, she, I didn't know how good I had it until she passed away. Um, and then I got put back into Sif's care. Um, and then they put me back into my mother's care, which I always stayed with her for about three months. Um, she was a stranger to me, and all she did was uh, introduce me to alcohol and drugs. So um, I didn't like it. So I went on the street and I stayed in clothing bins wherever I could under bridges, but I had a good time doing it, you know. Um, cannabis was there every day. Um, alcohol was there every day, so, you know, I didn't look at it as a bad thing. I just thought, you know, I grew up with it. What what was wrong with doing it with my friends? My uncles did it, my aunties did it. And, you know, when it's so normal in your family, you just grow up thinking it is normal. 
until you get to the age where you start getting in trouble for it and you start getting arrested. So um, basically, I ended up on the streets in New Plymouth. I, my older brother before that found me when I was 21 in Whangarei. I was actually um, a drug dealer, and my brother found me in Whangarei and told me that he found my four sisters in New Plymouth, um, which, so I haven't never met them for a long time. You know, I was three years old since I left, so now I found out I had my sisters, and I wanted a sense of family, so I went to New Plymouth. And when I was there, I found out that I had a father from New Plymouth, a little place called Waitara. And I kind of found a bit of roots for myself. But that didn't help me. I still stayed on the street every day drinking two bottles of homebrew and three tinnies wherever I could get it. You know, So um, that's all we did. We were 30 kids all under the bridge, smoking and drinking every day, got up, did the same thing. Know, ask people for a dollar until all of us got a dollar and then go and total it up at the end of the day and go and get on it and smoke. So from that, you know, went to jail five times um, from the same judge that helped us with the movie as well as another judge that really just thought my life was going to nowhere. Um, I met Polder at um, Waves Youth Health Centre and he told me, a um, first meeting of him, I, I said, I've got addiction, I need some help. He said, oh, mate, you can do it, just give up. You know, I was like, hey. I got up, walked out of there and said, hey, I don't know what this, you know, what's, what's he talking about? So I went, carried on doing it for a couple more years. But we had this group where we came into Waves and we had a little tiny computer, little eMac it was called back then, and we would do recordings of our songs, which was our ways or um, telling our story through our music. And um, I don't know if Polly used it to his advantage, but um, we, we were actually going to get on it one day and Polly said to me, hey, I was walking past Waves and I had my $20 in my pocket and I was going to get my tinny and my, my box as well and go and get on it. And he said, oh, mate, what are you doing today? I was like, nothing, well, why is that? He goes, would you like to come to Pariaka? I was like, Pariaka, don't even know what, where's this? And he was like, oh, you know they got free food. Oh, yep, yeah, I'm sold. That was me. I was in that car, um, went home, packed up a couple of blankets and went to Pariaka. Um, as I went through the gates of Pariaka, um, something happened to me, you know, um, something spiritual. I've never been to this place before, but for some reason my nana came flooding back and everything of her tikanga Māori, um, everything that I was getting taught from the age of 3 to 13 come flooding back. And I've got, I got into the marae called Te Niho o Te Ateaua, and a queer there was, you know, looking at me strange and that, and a few of my mates were like, oh, what's wrong with you, mate? You're a bit of a pussy, what's up here? And I'm like going, hey, I don't know what it is, brothers, but, you know, something's happening here. And they're like, oh, no, whatever, drama queen. So carried on, and then the queer said, um, boy, it's it's you getting in touch with your tūpuna. And for me right there and then, everything changed. Um, I did a wānanga, I think it was, and before that I just had no future. I had nothing, I didn't know what I was looking forward to and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I ended up getting gifted a kitty at the end of the wānanga. And that was an insp inspirational moment for me where, you know, I, my nana taught me, if you get gifted a kitty, you're supposed to fill that kitty with all the knowledge and every, everything good in your life. That's what that kitty is for. I, I left there feeling like, hey, man, I could do something with my life, but I still niggled back into the drugs and alcohol because that was the normal thing, get back into town and do the same old thing. Um, then Polter had the idea of hiding behind the green screen. And all we honestly thought was, hey, we get to meet Rio. We get to meet Francis Cora, you know, your Trinity Roots and Fat Freddy's Drop and, you know, Cora, yeah, that, that's us. We didn't know what we were in for. Um, till the four boys that, the four men that we took went out there, we were always the boys that were in town on it together. Um, we were actually called the C CCBs, we were named, because it was the Centre City Bums, because we sat outside every day and just drunk. Um, we went out to Pariaka and uh, honestly the feeling of this film was just real. You know, there was no cut 
keep going, stop, can you do that again? It was more of a natural effect of, hey, these awesome musicians that we look up to today, they've been through the same problems that we've been through, and maybe even harder, and yet look where they are now, you know? So in that retrospect, we looked at each other and we were like, hey, we could be these dudes, you know? We could be on stage with these guys. We could be doing something with our lives, you know? By that time, I've had, I had six kids by then, you know? So I wasn't a role model for them. That's how I looked at it. I looked at it as what future do they have if I'm still doing this? Is this going to be the norm for them when I grow up? Am I introducing them to something that I was introduced to? And it might sound cliche, but I know what it means to break the cycle. You know, um, and I've broken that cycle. And now, you know, um, I was done youth work for the last three years. I've helped 220 kids off the street um, to get on track, whether it's between education, jobs, or just being a better parent or a better role model in their families. So, um, you know, out of that 220, 75% of them are on their way. 23% um, 20, uh, of them are, you know, still dabbling back in it. But to, sadly to say, 2% of them are dead. So, um, you know, we have the factors of suicide and that and now thing that has related back to cannabis and synthetic cannabis as well. So, you know, this is the things that I'm dealing with now, but now I can walk down the street without, you know, the police harassing me. I've got police ringing me up asking, Lani, can you come and sort out these kids in the cell? They want you to come down. They won't settle down. So I'll be in there standing up in court and saying, hey, judge, I'll take this kid under my wing and I'm going to... Um, try something, you know, and then going back to that judge with a report and saying, this is what we've accomplished, this is what he wants to do, and hopefully it's going to work. You know, so in another form, you know, I'm one of the best youth workers New Plymouth has got now. So um, sadly to say we ran out of funding, but now I'm, I had to get a job at Teagle. So <laughs> um, I'm working at um, Teagle and doing that on the side, you know. So yeah, it's all because of a journey. You know, um, might have taken a long time, but you know, uh, it's been an awesome ride, and still going. So, yeah, kia ora. Just going back to this um, slide here, I wanted to put it up because you know the. Uh, the seed of the idea came about through a collaboration, which I thought was it was great. You know, it was quite unique, and that was between, you know, that was between Māori and Pākehā. Well, ultimately, you know, Judge Judge Murphy. I don't think he's got any um, Māori Pākehā, not that he told me about. But, but in a way, not that that mat would matter. But the, but the, the main point here is that he. The main point is that he came. Uh, Two, two waves and he wanted to make a difference and um, his, his whole um, placement in terms of the film was quite, um, I, I felt was quite uh, unique and it was something very different. Um, in the end we didn't have any funding to make the film and as you know if you're do, on a, doing a creative project and, and you want it to do um, the best it can you, you do need some financial assistance. So it's quite funny, at one stage he um, said, oh, we can't find funding, okay. Um, so he, the money that, that he got from the fines through the courts for cultivating cannabis went through to the film. <laughs> yeah. so it's great. <laughs> what better way to use the money, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it helped to actually complete um, the making of this film, um, along with support from other people, but um, that de definitely helped to achieve the momentum that the film needed, and to believe in it as well, to believe in the co-papa. Um, that was really at the heart of the film, and so therefore, you know, it's fr starting from there, it became very much of a, a collaborative exercise, and a lot of people put in their free time um, to to making it happen, you know, and. This was, this was one of the scenes in the film. Uh, this actually um, New Plymouth Prison, 
uh, this wing has been closed down now, so, uh, but at the time it was open, so we did some of the filming in there. And uh, like Lani said, you know, um, it was interesting because the four boys who were involved with, with this, um, I think all of them had been to, even Danny, the younger one? Yeah, yeah. So Danny was the youngest boy in, involved in the film and even he had been to, been prison um, prior to it. So, you know, the emphasis here was to stop our young people um, going to prison and going in, into any of the institutions. And um, that helped certainly with having uh, Rio on board. So, uh, you know, um, if you'd like to, to say something at, at this time, Rio. Not that, not that, I'm not looking at, <laughs> there's Judge Murphy, and there's Judge Murphy, and there's the, a few of the guys, a few of the boys, and Rio's got his uh, back to us. There, yeah. I think that's where we met. Didn't you come into? The, that's the first time you met. You came into the courtroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. Check, check. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I guess uh, my involvement with the uh, documentary, as Paul has said, has come about through uh, Anand, who was a mutual friend, and he uh, got in contact with me. Uh, I'm originally from Tamaranui. Um, I grew up there till I was. 17, 18, and then um, my mum actually made me leave town <laughs> and go and study. And you know, uh, I may have been the only, the first one to um, seek tertiary education. I think uh, in my whanau, um on mum's side anyway. But um, so prior, oh uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I, I moved to Wellington and studied music. Um, at the jazz school. Uh, from there, I kind of uh, went into the, the local music scene in Wellington. Um, along with Warren Maxwell, founded um, Trinity Roots, and then uh, played with a lot of other projects around Wellington, including Fat Freddy's Drop, um, oh, lots of stuff. Um, Holly Smith was uh, living in Wellington at that time as well, so I was involved with um, her projects. Um, and just lots of, of um, local music. Uh, and so anyway, uh, I got a, a call from Anand and he kind of explained the project uh, and I was really keen and really wanted to be involved. <clears throat> and so I came up to Taranaki and, and met Paura and stuff. And I guess uh, little to their knowledge was that I actually had my own quite, uh, I, uh, complicated, long sort of uh, experience with cannabis and being uh, coming under the, the Mental Health Act in terms of uh, a drug-induced psychosis, which led to uh, being uh, under the Mental Health Act in uh, an institution, in a, in a, initially in a Porirua Hospital and then um, up in Tokanui Hospital, which is now closed and stuff. But, uh, so this, this was all background that these guys didn't know before I come up to do the documentary, but ended up being really complimentary uh, in terms of being able to um, let these guys know uh, my own experience with, uh, you know, being, being introduced to cannabis. Um, and then, I mean, at the time before I had the, uh, the uh, admission, um, I was in my third year of study. I was kind of working about 25, 30 hours a week uh, and using cannabis really uh, to, to try and relax and try and uh, sort of uh, kind of sleep. And it actually had the opposite effect where I ended up, uh, you know, uh, not being able to sleep and then those, you know, contributing factors and. Uh, yeah, so, so that really helped, I think, in terms of being able to um, directly relate to what these guys are going through and then, uh, yeah, like, uh, hopefully, um, having been through that journey, coming out the other end, um, doing it again, <laughs> and then coming out of that, um, 
and then really kind of getting back on track and sort of, um, yeah, just, just I guess, um, making better choices uh, and the, the opportunity to help these guys to, to look at their choices and, and maybe, you know, um, be smarter about what they were doing was, yeah, it was cool. So from there we just um, met um, and made the documentary and, yeah, it was cool. So. <laughs> yeah, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> um. Where to now? There's this, there's this whakatauaki by, um, from Rongo Fakata by Taharako, and it goes, you know, one day uh, one of the others in the tribe approached uh, Taharako and said, he ta'a, he hata to o te rangatira. And Taharako's reply was, ah, he pā tu wata wata, te nā te to o te rangatira. So this, this proverb um, and it's something that we looked at in the, in the film and, and I'm sure that Lani's looked at that in terms of his work with, with Rangatahi since then as well. And uh, it, Patu Watawata, it refers in the old days uh, when we used to live together more closely as communities um, and that's, you know, within the Māori world is that the palisades that surrounded the marae were known as Patu. So you knew that those palisades actually protected your community. And so in terms of our, our men or our warriors, our Ngā Tangata tō, they turned outwards. They were those pā too. So they faced outwards to ensure that nothing untoward came into the community. The next line of defence were was the um, the koroheke, so the the more older kind of seasoned generals, men, you know, the who are part, you know, more or less been fighting, but but past their use by day, but date perhaps, you know, and uh, they were facing in, so they faced more inwards to make sure that nothing happened within the in the community. Then the next line of of defence is you had our our, uh, uh, our queer, the grandmothers. So they were facing inwards as well. And then we had the mothers who were in the inner circle and then we have, had our mokopuna. So we ensured that, that nothing, that all those, that future generation were, were being looked after. There's a... There's another story actually, and that's the name of the presentation. I call it Matapuna because Matapuna, um, Rio said it's actually a suburb in, uh, <laughs> in Tomarunui. <laughs> but <laughs> Matapuna really refers to Mata as the face and the Puna as a spring. Right? So it's about turning to face the spring. And. Um, there was a story of, a, of the tūpuna. Now, the tūpuna decided one day he'd walk to the top of the mountain, Maungafo, since we're here. Walked to the top of Maungafo. Didn't take him li- long, not like walking to the top of Ruapehu or somewhere like that. But anyway, he finally got to the top of the mountain. And uh, when he got to the top, there was a spring. So there was a waipuna. And the tūpuna stood in the spring. And as you know, if you look at the word tūpuna, tu means to stand, and puna means spring. So the tūpuna was standing in the spring, and he looked down, and with his face, which is mata, so, and he realised that he, when he looked into the spring, he saw his, um, his tā moko. That was his reflection, the moko. And then also his mokopuna, he realised that actually that was his mokopuna, so that was his grandchild, was actually his reflection. Hence the word mokopuna. Interesting, eh? Māori language. <laughs> so, so this idea of generations, 
There's this idea of generations here. Not just this generation, but our children's generation and our children's generation after that. And that comes from a particular worldview. You know. And I believe, as a modern society today, that's the worldview that we all need. Māori, Pākehā, everybody. That's the worldview in which we can all learn from, that we can be in the experience of, because uh, that, that knowledge base, we, it, it's still living. It's something which is still living, and it's still being practised. Um, the other thing with the Māori with the Māori worldview is that it's, it's very much um, based on experience. It's very much based on introducing that experience to others and realising that everything is interconnected. So there's an understanding right from the beginning that there's an interconnectedness. This Pa to Wata Wata, those palisades, unfortunately, and that's what we talk about today. So, unfortunately, because those palisades have been broken down through the introduction of drugs and alcohol, and when we ask the question, what has that really done? That's really impeded our potential. There's another whakatauaki, which is um, e kore koe ngaro he kākono e rua mai rangi atea, which means if you, you will never be lost because you are a seed planted at rangi atea. <clears throat> so our challenge, if you like, is how to, how to put up that face, you know, that mā tāpuna, how to, ref how to have a true reflection with those whom we work with to ensure that we, we are in the integrity of what's been passed down through the generations. It's interesting this word, and that's why I like our relationship, you know, as, as Māori and, and Pākehā, because I think there's potential there. There's potential in terms of understanding about those things that have come into this world that which we don't want as a society, hence putting back, back up our par two and those things which are good to keep in that we can, we've learned from one another. You know, Māori, the translation for Māori really is ordinary. You know, I don't know if you know that, but it's, it, it's ordinary. Um, also refers to a vibration, an ori, as a, like a vibration and Mars like light, you know, but still, you know, the literally sort of ordinary. Pākehā was sort of considered in the early days as extraordinary because they were. When Pākehā first came, it was something that was extraordinary, you know, coming off the sea, something that was different. Um, so worldview is, is really important in terms of working with people because if we can't step into those, that world of those whom we're working with, uh, how are they going to see their own reflection? That's the question that I have. You know, it doesn't really matter what model that you may be working with. But, you know, the question really is how are you able to show that person their reflection? Mm -hmm. He says that there's another whakatoa ki tō piki amakura no tōku piki amakura no ku. So, you know, you have your school of learning and I have my school of learning. And... Um, that's okay, you know, it's not, it's not a problem, but what school of learning will benefit those whom we are working with right here and now? You know, Paulo Frare, a great educationalist from Brazil, said, you know, those who name the world, own the world, you know. So in terms of those who we're working with, how do we bring back a, a sense of understanding and connection to their world. Lani, like, you know, Lani mentioned those, mentioned those things in his, his, um, in his partly, you know, sharing his story, those things which rooted him back into who he was, you know, finding 
that essence of, of what made him from the beginning. I'm just going to skip here. I'm going to skip, uh, if I can, I'm just going to skip here a few times because I think this is really important to go on to. So a person's essence, a person's e- essence is when we look at tapu. So when we're looking in terms of a Māori worldview, we look at um, this word tapu. Tapu is not only just something sacred it's, as it's been defined past, but it also, it also talks about potentiality. Ta means to lay and pu means potentiality. So there's three different dimensions it's, it's, it's good to think about, it's good to contemplate and to know about. The first one is to do with atua, the second one is to do with whenua, and the, second one, the, the third one is to do with tangata. So is this a model? <laughs> perhaps. You know, it's, it's a way of seeing, it's a way of perceiving and being in a particular world view. So, if we, you know, the question that I really have in terms of working with people who had suffered from drug and alcohol addictions, problems, is that what will help them achieve their potential? Right? What will help them to achieve their potential so that they are in a position to contribute within society? So that they are in a position that they can monarchy, right? So if we go back to these two words, tapu is to do with that potentiality. Everybody, every single person, every human being, every being is actually born with a sense of tapu. And that's what we call tapu iti tangata. So e, e refers to something intrinsic, right? When we look at the whenua, we look at the, the whenua, which also encompasses the moana, it encompasses the elements. Tapu iti, iti whenua. So tapu iti whenua refers to the intrinsic tapu that the whenua holds. Tapu iti atua refers to the intrinsic tapu that the, the dimension of the atua hold. So does anybody, can, is anybody out there able to tell me their understanding or definition of atua? Anybody? Yes? Pardon? Divinity. Divinity? Divine being, yes. Anybody else? High power, okay. Anybody else? What's that? (laughs) God, okay. God, yes. Anybody else? Actually, it reminds me of this um, story. So I just stopped there. (laughs) There was... (laughs) You know, there's this minister, and um, he's in Scotland, actually. He used to live in Scotland. And when he first became a priest, he prayed to God that he thought, oh, I'm going to pray to God that I can save the world. And then he realized, oh, it's too late. So then he thought to, um, then he prayed to God, and he thought, oh, that's, you know, this is not working, this um, praying to God business. So he thought, well, you know, he's not being able to save anybody. So then he prayed to God, well, God, please, can you help me save my family at least? Too late. So he said, geez, I can't save my family. So then he prayed to God that he could save himself. And it was too late. He passed away. So, yeah, that's written, <laughs> that's written on his inscription, actually, on his tombstone, this um, minister in, uh, in Scotland. So, anyway, reminded me of that story. <laughs> Atua. Atua, it's, you know, if you look at the word as well, I mean, it's always important with Māori words. If you look at it, a means uh, it refers to pri- something primordial, like primordial stand, uh, sound. Tu means to stand, 
and are is once again it goes back to that primordial uh, state of um, of being or sound. It, it also it's I've heard it referred to in the past um, by Rooker Broughton as, as as letting your consciousness stand in space. See the other thing about the Māori world, which is quite interesting, that because everything's connected, we we it's not like there are things that exist independently in and of ourselves. As you know, if we look to the whenua, then we are made of the whenua, our bodies are. You know, so the same thing with atua, um, which you've, people mention too, our, maybe our own sense of divinity or, or um, something that which is connected to our own consciousness. But they do, but as you know, so if we look outside our perception, they also exist outside ourselves. So in terms of atua, quite often also they're referred to as kaitiaki, as guardians, um, that abide in certain domains in relationship to the whenua and in relationship to, to human beings. So everything has an intrinsic sense of tapu. Now when it's in relationship to, so we say tapu o te atua, or tapu o te whenua, or or tapu o te, o te tangata means that the, it's the relationship of atua to whenua and to tangata and vice versa. The relationship of whenua to atua and to tangata. And the relationship of tangata to whenua and to atua. So our, when a child is born, they have that intrinsic sense of tapu. So here's the big question, right? when it comes to alcohol and drugs? Here's the big question. So, if a child is born with that sense of potentiality in terms of the, its tapu and, and its relationship with the whenua and with atua, born, when, when is it? What's that time? What's that period of time when there's been a violation of tapu? When has that occurred in that person's life? So we know with we know with marijuana cannabis users, right? Or you know other drugs. This goes for other drugs as well. We know that there's those who Rio and I talked about this before. We know there's, there's those who experiment. The experimenters in life, and we know that there's those who experiment and become habitual users, and then we know that there's an element in there that is we call covering up the pain. So what we need to know, really, if we're working with people, we really, t really need to know is when, w when was that person's first painful experience? Right? We need to know, if, trauma if you like, I suppose that's another description, but when when, how, how can we know, or how can that person go back to that place as when that person was first separated from their own sense of tapu? When that happened, they become in a state of negative nor. Being in a state of negative nor meaning, means that they can't see their reflection in the mirror. So looking into that puna, they can't see that anymore. So therefore, talking about mana, so mana goes with tapu. Mana is something which, which comes about by achieving our, achieving our potentiality in relationship. So if if you have your potentiality, which is your tapu, if there hasn't been a violation of tapu, then you're able to achieve your mana, your mana in relationship with those other dimensions. You are able to manaki. So, you know, mana, manaki comes off mana. Manaki, you know, you would have seen this morning, it happened with the porphyry. The whole, the whole purpose of having a porphyry is to manaki your manuhiri those people who you are meeting, joining with, and greeting, right? And vice versa. So if you, if you don't have that ability to monarchy because your sense of tapu has been impeded, 
how, how are you going to achieve that? So with Lani, uh, so with you, so asking the question, is this, is this sounding right for you in terms of your, if you, so what I'm doing now, I'm asking you to reflect on that time, you talked about a little bit, but that time when you, when you felt disconnected from the world and what happened, and then what gave you that sense? When, when did it turn around for you so that you were able to feel like you are in a position to give again? Well, f Hello? Oh. For myself, um, thinking back, right back, was three years old. You know, um, being whangoid out of your family um, to the point where you feel unwanted. Your mother didn't want you, you know, but you've got two older brothers there. What's wrong with me? Why am I getting gifted away? Um, that was the most painful thing for me, thinking about it now. Um, I didn't realise it for a lot, a lot of years, but once I did be able to sit there at Pariaka and talk to Tafiti at his tombstone and figure out that that's where it happened for me, you know, um, and it stayed with me. And all I wanted was acceptance from my mother, but I didn't get it, you know. Um, and to this day, I still won't get it. Um, but. The turning point for me that turned me around was the fact that when I went through those pariaka gates and being gifted that kite and remembering that I was gifted to a beautiful queer, you know, and she loved me like if I was her own. That was the turning point for me in my day and age now that back then I was 25 years old. You know, it took from the age of three to her passing at 13 and to that age of 25 to go to a spiritual place of passive and resistance for everything to turn around and say, hey, I was gifted away to a beautiful lady who gave me everything in the world that now I can handle everything, whether it's, it was getting, getting my mana back in another instance and saying, hey, while well, I've done this, now it's going to take a long road for me to get back on my feet, but it's achievable. And I remember my nana saying back to me when I was 11 years old, and because I had done something stupid, and she said, you know, boy, you always take the, the long road around things, you know. You like to take the hardest route with things, but in the end you'll get there. And that stuck to me to this day, you know, and... No, now I can say to her, and I know she'll be proud, and she'll be standing there, you know, in, in heaven or wherever she is, and be able to say that, you know, my moko is now uh, a role model for his own family. Because my own family now, I, I have, I, I, my grandmother, my real grandmother died uh, two years ago, and I was able to go up to the marae where we were from in Fananaki. Whakapaumahara is called, and stand there, and no one in my family could speak Māori. No one could represent our family. No one knew how to do the tikanga on the wall of the photos. But because I was brought up from this grand auntie who taught me everything like that, I was able to put the photos up, be proud, have my mother in that standing at the back of me, and represent my family, and not feel like I was doing it for them, feel I was doing it for myself. And for the tikanga and whakapapa that was passed down to me and being able to say, hey, now I have to stand up and be this for my kids. So, you know, this is the, the beauty of it all, you know. You can, you might, might have had this rough upbringing, but you can come through and be something outstanding and it still hasn't finished you see so um yeah that that's it for me yeah
does that make sense in terms of your journey? Was there a point in time where you were able to look in that spring, you know, that, that waipuna, and say, oh, okay, I can see something's cleared, I can see properly now, and I, am, I feel like I'm in that position where I can achieve my potential? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, it wasn't, you know, um, a bit like Lani here, you know, it was a, 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 the long kind of road around to it. But I think, um, you know, like often it's, it's when you get presented with a, um, some really challenging situations that you, you know, you have to kind of um, address those painful kind of issues. And, um, you know, for me, I, my, my father left when I was a baby. Uh, I grew up with my grandparents. My grandfather died when I was eight. Uh, he was probably the most positive male <clears throat> role model I had had up until that point. Um, and so, the, like the, the the song that we did at the start, that, that's uh, about my grandmother and my mother, and and these people who were uh, positive role models in in my life. And uh, you know, in classic, it's it's often the the, the wahine, you know, wahine to the the strong woman that. Um, are there to uh, pick up the pieces or provide some sort of kind of uh, stability. Um, but yeah, in terms of my own journey and in terms of being, uh, you know, within the mental health uh, act and, and uh, going through the hospitals and stuff, um, actually the turning point was probably seeing a lot of uh, Māori, Polynesian, a lot of youth in there and just kind of... Um, I think I was 22 at the time when I first had a, an episode, which, you know. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was pretty confronting. And, and I, I was just really surprised at how many young people were there. And um, I don't know. And then, you know, obviously with the support of my family, I was able to, um, and good friends and stuff, um, you know, kind of uh, find a uh, workable solution for me. Um, and then what was motivating me was also that uh, sense of like seeing, seeing these people that, um, you know, the, the problems that they were going through, they seemed to be, uh, you know, m medication and stuff. That I, it didn't seem, and even in my own experience, I didn't find it... Um, uh, it wasn't actually, if anything, it was making, it, seemed, it felt like it was making things worse. I mean, I, I think initially there's the, um, you know, the uh, intervention, I guess, or uh, kind of brings things back to, to a sense where you can start to um, assess what's been going on. But I think I just felt that um, I needed to kind of get off the medication and deal with some stuff and, you know, uh, for anyone who isn't familiar with uh, that kind of aspect of um, the health, uh, um, you know, mental health and being um, under the Mental Health Act and stuff, um, you have to take medication. You know, you you don't really get the choice um, until there's a point where they believe that you can uh, are no longer a risk to yourself or or the community. So that. Um, initially meant, uh, you know, court action for myself. And at the time I was like heavily uh, medicated. I could barely hold my head up uh, in the court case, let alone uh, express to the, to the judge that, um, you know, this isn't usually me. And this is just like one small instance that, um, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess like, getting back to your question of like where, where they, uh, changed the, the turnaround came of, of like just realizing that um, if I could get myself through uh, find uh, ways that I could um, look after myself then maybe those uh, mechanisms could be something that I could um, share with other people that I saw in there who I, I just reminded me of me and that were just it really uh, seemed like convinced that that was their their uh, that was it, you know. That now they were, uh, you know, they were uh, mental health patients, and that 
this is this is their life and stuff. And I, I don't know. I just had this feeling that um, you know, that yeah, the potential was um, greater than that, and that if uh, if there was a way to kind of connect with them and maybe try and uh, get that across, then that that's a better outcome than uh, dependency. And that was the big thing. I think you know. Uh, was making that association of like uh, dependency on anything, whether it was the drugs or the medication. You know, I just needed to find that um, that tapu and that mana again within myself, uh, and then just like work with that. And uh, you know, it's a it's a learning process, and it's you know, it's not just like a light switch that you turn off and on. And there's uh, you know, just yeah, there's different challenges in each day, kind of um, yeah, just. But you get into a groove and yeah, find things, and it just progresses from there. Kia ora. So a pathway forward is, you know, that's um, hopefully, you know, that's what what we're able to reflect on here is that interrelationship with that we we have um, we have a merely as a fact of of our birth is that we have that connection and that relationship within those three domains, you know, of atua, whenua, and tangata. Are there any questions so far? Yes. You know, but being able to turn it around and help myself, I was able to turn it around and help these kids when they were in the strife, when they were going through hell, so to speak. Being there and not giving up on them, bro. You know, being able to say to them, hey, mate, you know, no matter what you do in life, I'm still going to be here. But be also being able to be that, that tough guy and say, hey, mate, you've got to get off your butt and do something about it, you know. You're not going to be handed a platter and say, here, here's life, it's easy ass, because it ain't. You know, um, so being real, you know, just like you today, being real. But, um, you know, that, that's the amazing thing about it, bro, um, is, you know, watching these kids go home and they're telling their parents, bro, you know, and their parents coming up to you and shaking your hand and saying, I remember you a few years ago, mate, you know, I used to get on the piss with you, actually, but... Thank you very much for the help that you helped my kids, you know, um, it's amazing. So that's the benefits of it, bro. Um, um, it's not going to happen overnight, you know, for yourself, but once you do, you, you know, it only gets better, bro. You know, the natural highs are there um, every day. You know, um, get out of your comfort zone and do it. You know, I, I was that guy that used to, um, what do you call it, hide under a blanket and pretend the world's not there. So I used to get wasted in that and just pretend, yeah, no one's there. My, my influences were Tupac, Easy, e you know, all those gangster guys, because that's what I felt like when I was stoned. You know, when I was getting stoned, that's all, yeah, I'm, I'm a thug, I, I'm like them. Put on, you know, Easy e and that, and just nod your head. Yeah, that, that's how I thought was awesome, bro. But then it got to a point where the high wasn't there, you are just getting stoned. You know what I mean? Um, the first time you ever got wasted, you felt your heart beat fast. You know, you thought you were going to die. You know, those kind of feelings. You never ever got that back. So you just go and smoke more and more and more of it to get more higher and maybe even get, you know, go on to harder drugs to get that high. And then once you're at the top, you know, it's a long way to fall. So it, it just gets harder and harder for you. I hope that answers it, bro. Other questions? Yes, a guy in a checkered shirt.
Rio. <laughs> oh, sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> Oh man, that's a difficult question. I think, you know, um, personally, uh, yeah, the, the drugs have been an impedance in terms of um, being creative. Um, I mean, there's plenty of examples of uh, where it hasn't, where, you know, where, where um, a lot of famous artists were, were chronic, you know, um, drug abusers. Um, so it's, a, it's really hard. I think, um, I think the previous speaker, you know, um, kind of touched on a, a, a few, you know, like the, it's the personality makeups that can um, influence that. Um, yeah, just just speaking for myself, I think um, definitely learnt that um, I'm actually better off not doing anything like that. Uh, and it kind of ties back into what uh, Polter's been talking about in terms of, um, you know, I realised when I, I mean, my exposure to music, to music was through my family, you know, like classic sort of um, people jamming, playing guitar, parties and stuff. Um, and that was a buzz. And so there was like uh, the natural high of, of music as opposed to um, the artificial high of, of using drugs to get there. And yeah, just kind of, if, again, like talking about dependence before, and it's just like, and, um, there was no need for me to be high to enjoy music when I, when I, you know, I just love music. So um, it was good to make that kind of um, revelation and just sort of, yeah, I realized that it was actually detrimental to me to be, um, yeah, drugs and, drugs and I don't mix really, but it took about 15 years to um, come to that conclusion. <laughs> um, there's one, one bit of that, um, there was one on the movie that Fran, Francis Cora said, um, you know, um, and I got it, it was because, you know, we did some awesome music on the street, you know, there was us there in a circle, one beatboxing, other one jumping and freestyling all the time, you know, that was our, our music scene, and the other one doing a bit of sister act on the side, you know. Um, but, you know, when we got in the studio and we were creating things while we were stoned, you know, um, he says on the movie, we had to be that high to get that creativity back. You know, so we had to go to that same place of getting stoned again before we could create something. Um, it was so hard to do, you know, so we thought we had to do it all the time. Where once I had given up the cannabis and that, it just made everything easier. I couldn't get up on stage and perform for you. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to do that just because we only did it behind closed doors. We didn't go out there to go in front of a whole bunch of um, people that we didn't know and just perform. We would rather go into our own little group that all smoked together, that all drunk together and just do our music. So getting back to the tikanga with our stuff, you know, um, we we had to learn some different difficult stories that happened to our um, Māori people to make us understand our um, traits, such as the stories of Māori that helped us with the traits of being sneaky and conniving and those little things that Māori was, you know. So, so it helped us to um, learn where we got these little traits from, you know our heritage of being sneaking and cunning and all those kind of stuff, but also knowing the hurt that had happened to, you know, people like Pariaka and, you know, sitting there and going, far, that happened to us. That was us. We're Māori. We're not American. We're not thugs. We're not gangsters. We are warriors. And being able to stand up and be one. So, yeah. Uh, 
on that as well, it sort of it, it's it, it goes in terms of the tikanga, right? So, in terms of how I've been taught anyway, is that uh, tikanga comes from the end understanding of kawa. And Kawa really talks about those relationships once again in regards to those three dimensions of atua, whenua, and tangata. You, in terms of being in a wānanga, and, you know, we could talk about being in a, this as being a wānanga, but a wānanga is, it's, it's in being in a place where you increase the understanding of everybody who's there, you know, that's what the film turned into being in the end. You know, it was a wānanga of understanding. And when Lani mentioned it earlier, a journey, you know, and that journey's still going on. That's why we're here, right? So, but the film was completed when way back in 2010. Uh, you know, that's the other th challenge I'd like to put out, you know, is that in terms of our work and what we do, and I we haven't heard from everybody here in terms of what you do, but, you know... Um, this, what we're talking about here is something which is intergenerational, you know, so something that goes beyond our lifetime, you know, that's the thinking, you know, um, when that toko toko is passed to the next person, then it's up to them to carry that on, and, you know, Lani's been doing that, and he's, I'm sure he's passed that on to other young people that he's working with as well, but, I mean, how do you ensure to how can we ensure to do that? I mean, we can't do that in a nine-to-five job because it doesn't have a clock because it's about relationship. It's not about the clock. It's about our continuing relationship with one another, you know. So that kind of goes out of the parameters of just trying to define it to a particular point of time. It's about making sure that we're, con we're continuing to nurture those relationships we had a, we had a um, something that we used in our wānanga as well, which I which I think is quite helpful in terms of that concept around pa tu wata wata. Is that once we start to look inwards again and to protect and nurture our communities, is that if you look at a marae, a marae doesn't have one pai pai. It actually has five. We call that na pai erima. So we have the pai pai that you would have seen this morning, you know, those who stand to speak. And we have the kai karanga, which is one pai pai. We also have the, the other, another pai pai is uh, those who, who stand to support and, and totoko and, and waiata. The other pai pai is the dining room and then the kitchen. And the other pai pai are the hunters and gatherers. So that's quite full. If you look at it in terms of our community, that's, that, that, that encompasses us, us all. So when we use um, here tangata puno, those who work in servitude, those who work in servitude in our community, um, it's, not a, it's, a, you know, it's not a hierarchical system. It's, it's, it's really a, an acknowledgement that we all have something to contribute. We all have something really important to contribute. Those, those of those people in the uh, out there who are um, are suffering from drug addiction, alcohol problems, those are the ones who are crying out to contribute. They want to make their con contribution just like we do. They're also part of that pai pai, na pai irima, with in terms of our community. So. So, you know, how the, the question really, the, the, the main question I feel that we should be asking one another is how, how are we going to create pathways for those people to contribute? You know, and, and so we also have to ask ourselves that question, how are we contributing? You know, how, what mirror are we holding up in terms of our work, which we're doing, that can help those others come into into play.